Hello there. So today is a pretty exciting day. It's someone's birthday. And that someone isn't a human being, but rather an international organization consisting of over 190 member states. That's right, it's the United Nations birthday today. Specifically, the United Nations is turning 75 today. Now, this is an occasion that will literally never happen again, and so I thought, why not make a video on the UN? So this video will first go over the history of the League of Nations, which is sort of the father to the UN. Then I will go over the history of the United Nations. So ready to go? Good. So World War I was bad, and not many people liked it. This meant that after the armistice, which ended the First World War, was signed on November 11th, 1918, many people wanted the major powers to find a way to prevent a repeat of the war. The Paris Peace Conference was the negotiations held following Germany's surrender in the First World War, and most people agreed that the main point of the conference should be to avoid another major war. Woodrow Wilson, who was the President of the United States at the time, pushed very hard for the creation of a League of Nations whose main purpose would be to avoid another global war. This would be created, and a total of 44 states would join the League at its launch. Notably, however, the United States of America never joined the League of Nations, despite their president being one of the main forces behind the League's creation. The reason for this was that many senators didn't like the conditions of joining the League, mainly the fact that many senators wanted Congress to be the only way for America to go to war. This meant that Wilson was unable to get the two-thirds majority needed to join the League of Nations, and unwilling to compromise, the U.S. would stay out of the League. Now, the League of Nations was incredibly complex, like everything in life, but the basic gist of what you need to know is that the organization's main goal was to achieve world peace. Uh, let's see how that one worked out for them. Now, the fact that the U.S. never joined the League is quite significant, as it marred the organization's reputation, since the United States had emerged from the First World War the New World Power. The League of Nations kept on going, however, and it did alright. For a bit, the many conflicts that occurred in the period between the World Wars each posed a problem for the League, and the League of Nations, while it's debatable whether or not they achieved their goal of making the world more peaceful, certainly proved themselves to be influential. Each of the interventions that the League of Nations led could warrant their very own videos, but I'd like this video to say short and a simple summary. I also may have left the writing of this video a bit too late. A conflict that showed some of the weaknesses and problems that the League of Nations had was the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. This Abyssinian crisis, as it would later be known as, showed some of the inherent flaws of the League. Essentially, after Benito Mussolini ordered Italian troops to invade Ethiopia, the League of Nations condemned the war, but didn't end up taking much actual action against Italy to punish them. Sanctions were called, but they weren't very effective, since goods such as oil, were not banned from being exported. In the end, the major powers didn't want to face the threat of an Italian conflict, and since the Great Depression was currently in full swing, many nations didn't want to risk further economic damage by issuing trade embargoes. This whole ordeal demonstrated that the League of Nations could be influenced by the self-interests of its members. Here's another piece to the puzzle that explains why the League of Nations failed. You see, the Soviet Union joined the League in 1935, and the fact that they waited 15 years to join meant that they stripped further legitimacy from the organization. This would be compounded by the fact that just four years later, during the Second World War, the Soviet Union was expelled from the League of Nations for invading Finland in the Winter War. So now, let's get to the elephant in the room. World War II. Although the League of Nations was founded to avoid a repeat of the First World War, they ended up failing in that regard, and allowed for an even more destructive war to occur just 20 years later, in the form of the Second World War. Essentially, the League was unable to prevent the war, because it didn't yield enough power to influence the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan, which had all previously left the organization. While the League of Nations initially tried to secure peace early on in the war, it soon became clear that this war would be a conflict of immense proportions. In 1943, Allied powers met in Tehran, where they agreed to create a new organization to replace the League of Nations after the war. The organization was to be called the United Nations. Now, it's important to understand that the UN wasn't an entirely new entity to the League, but rather it was in many ways a reorganization of what the League of Nations was. In this regard, many of the groups which existed within the League of Nations were transferred to the new United Nations. So the UN was officially signed into existence when, shortly after the surrender of Japan in the Second World War, representatives from 50 different nations met in San Francisco to write the United Nations Charter. As of its founding, 
51 nations from across the world were member states. Now, just like the League of Nations, the United Nations is incredibly complex, with a myriad of organs and assemblies and legal bodies and all sorts of stuff that I can barely understand. But the basics of what you need to know is that there is a General Assembly, which as of today consists of 193 member states, and is responsible for the deliberation and policy making of the UN. There is also the Security Council, made of five permanent members, those being the USA, the UK, France, Russia, and China. The Security Council also consists of 10 nations that are elected to their positions for two-year terms. Now, some of these nations are very well known, like Germany and Indonesia, but some nations that are currently elected to the UN Security Council are, how should I say this, not as mainstream. For example, there is St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a nation so obscure that if I told you had successfully colonized Mars, you'd have no real way of proving me wrong. Anyways, the UN Security Council is responsible for deciding on threats to peace or ongoing UN missions, and on some occasions, imposing sanctions on other nations. Every single UN member is forced to comply with the rulings of the Security Council. There are other organs of the UN, like the Judiciary Branch, the Economic and Social Council, and many more, but I have neither the time nor the qualifications to discuss those in detail. I will, however, leave a link in the description of this video where you can go and have a read about the United Nations. The website is the UN's About Us section, essentially. So I feel as though, since my name is Cut Up History, I should start talking about some of the UN's history. Now, after its founding, the UN was immediately thrust into the Cold War, where it would have to try and avoid the world's two new global superpowers from blowing everyone up. A trend that occurred during the Cold War was that the UN would act as a middle ground between the competing ideologies of communism and capitalism. While NATO, for example, was an organization made to suppress the spread of communism and the power of the USSR, the UN was an organization that would be willing to hear both sides and not dismiss one out of hand for being wrong or evil. Something else that occurred during the Cold War was decolonization. While nations such as the UK and France were letting go of their colonies across the world, namely Africa, there were also all of a sudden, many new nations that were put into existence. These new nations also all had many problems to deal with, like how to run a country that has had a century of racial and religious divides sewn into it by its old colonizing powers. These issues would breed conflicts, and so many of the UN's peacekeeping missions would be located in Africa and other previously colonized areas and nations. Now, the very first UN peacekeeping mission occurred during the Suez Crisis, in which Israel, along with the help of France and the UK, invaded the Sinai Peninsula to try and capture the Suez Canal. As a result of this conflict, the UN would create a peacekeeping force that aimed to intervene in conflicts and reduce the loss of life from them. A major force behind the creation of this initiative was Lester Pearson, who was at the time the Canadian Minister for External Affairs. Pearson would go on to win a Nobel Peace Prize for his actions and also become the 15th person to ever serve as Prime Minister of Canada. So the UN would continue gaining new members at a steady pace, until almost every single nation currently in existence was a part of it. The UN has shaped our modern world, and I probably will revisit this topic some other time in the future, as there is so much to talk about, but I unfortunately just do not have enough time to go very into detail about anything if I want to get this out actually on time. So therefore, I am going to end this video here. I hope you liked it. Once again, happy 75th UN, and with that, I would like to say thank you for watching, and have a good day.